Welcome to Current Issues with Dr. Kirk Megu for Tuesday, the 22nd of January, 2019. I'm glad to have you here. We begin with today's memo, Rethinking Sandals, Tourism, and Tobago. When Sandals pulled out of negotiations last week, it became a major issue that people around the country have been talking about. What makes it even more spectacular is that this happened just a few days after the Prime Minister's Mind Your Business presentation, in which he was talking about the state of the economy, how bad it was, and how his government was going to make it better. So, it was bad timing. The political blame game now reached another level, with the Prime Minister again blaming the UNC as usual, but this time also including independent activists like Afra Raymond, who took the government to court in order to have the details of the Sandals Agreement made public, and also the media for raising questions about the deal. The Prime Minister argues that this has created a hostile environment for Sandals, and this is why Sandals pulled out. And we can argue about the politics and whether this was the real reason Sandals left for days and days. People have been doing so already. What I want to raise, however, are some larger issues. Namely, was Sandals really going to bring about the development of Tobago and the diversification of our economy as projected? If so, can another large hotel replace Sandals? And should we invite them or even Sandals again, but this time in a more transparent process where there are multiple bidders and the terms of investment and the benefits of that investment made public from the start? Or should we think about other models for t development in Tobago? Why are we so fixated on tourism? Is it really our best option? Or are we just copying the other islands instead of thinking creatively on our own? I think we're just copying and we haven't done the hard work necessary. Tonight, my guest is Marla Dukaran. Caribbean economist, a Trinidadian based in Barbados. Ms. Dukaran is a top economist and thought leader in the Caribbean, well known for her monthly Caribbean economic report, monitoring major economic developments in key regional markets. Her insights into sandals, tourism, and Caribbean development will be valuable in looking at the sandals pullout of negotiations and understanding what it means for Trinidad and Tobago's development. We'll be back to discuss this issue right after this short break. We all want to save money without compromising on the best quality insurance coverage. If you are renewing your motor or homeowner insurances soon, then call us at ACTA Consultants. With over 27 years in the insurance industry, we can offer you significant savings on your insurance premiums. As agent for Guardian Group, we assure you the best quality coverage at a very competitive price. Email us at actagroupmail at gmail.com. Welcome back, and I'm joined by Marla Dukaran from Barbados, a Caribbean economist. Welcome, Marla. Thank you, Kirk. Thanks for having me. All right. So how is it in Barbados over there? Right now, it's very hot. <laughs> okay. Just like Trinidad. Not unlike Trinidad, exactly. <laughs> Not unlike Trinidad. Right, right. So as you know, um, we're talking this week about the sandals deal falling through in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And I just want to know... Um, as a Trinidadian, but you're in Barbados and you work throughout the Caribbean, I think your perspective would be very valuable for us to hear. So what's your take on the sandals pullout in the context specifically of the development of Tobago? Well, you know, the first thing I would want to say about sandals is the fact that from the start, it, the whole deal lacked transparency and, and that was evident when... Um, Afra Raymond had to take the government to court to get the details of the MOU released. In the first place, any deal that is in the best interest of the development of any country ought to be made transparent. Otherwise, there are then questions about how appropriate and, and to what extent is it really the best deal from a development or any other standpoint. 
And so that is the first thing that suggests that it was not such a good idea. Um, otherwise, what, what would you have to hide if it was a good idea? Any mm point -hmm. to the well-being of the country, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, your question around the development of, of Tobago. Um, I am not sure that any real empirical work has been done to determine what, from a developmental standpoint, is is in the best interest of Tobago, what, from a development standpoint, should be done um, to, to diversify their economy, to make their economy sustainable, um, to create jobs and growth and that kind of thing. I have not seen any development plans. I know that as a nation, we had Vision 2020, and then um, that got thrown out by the last government, and now we have a Vision 2030. Um, but I have not had a chance to see that 2030 and to see if there's anything in there specific to Tobago. So my, my response to your question would really be, what is in the best interest from a development standpoint for Tobago has to be determined by the data and by the empirical uh, studies, and I don't know that that has happened. So I can't say for sure that this standards or anything else for that matter would have been consistent with the development needs of Tobago or not. Right. Well, so we're operating in a vacuum and by VAPs, as we say, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and that's really the case for so many things in our countries throughout the Caribbean. We operate in vacuums with, with far from complete or, or even sufficient data. Exactly. And that's a, a, a very real thing we have to grapple with, either in the private sector, in government, as policymakers, as commentators, whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of your experience um, working up and down the Caribbean, uh, Sandals is a Caribbean brand. It's in other countries. Um, what, what's your impression, if, if you don't have any hard data, but what's your impression of you know, Sandals' effect on development in the other islands? So actually, there was a point in time that I was in discussions with Sandals and the Caribbean Tourism Organization to do a study a paper called the sandals effect and what we were going to do is measure the impact that sandals had when they entered Grenada mm -hmm. and Barbados specifically because in those two countries what happened was there was a property that went up for receivership if you will yeah and then sandals took over last source in Grenada and Armand. one of sandals properties or another property that sandals it was bought. an existing so the last source hotel in Grenada and the Armand um, properties here in Barbados that Sandals acquired. Right. And so it was a good way to, to, to look at the tourism sector, the way it looked before, and then on the data of Sandals, look at the data following their um, entry into the right. market. And so it was a perfect experiment to, to look at the data yeah. and see exactly. And Sandals was commissioning this study itself? No, they didn't commission it. I, I reached out to them and said, I just would like to do this, this right. study. But the, in the end, the data that we needed, um, they weren't able to provide. Anyway, what... Because it's we, commercially sensitive or it was hard to get at? Both. Right. Both. So the data that was publicly available um, to us that we were able to get from the airport, for, for example, um, data around airlift, data around the numbers of arrivals, data around the tourism spend. All of that data, um, the tourism or the Caribbean Tourism Organization um, was able to collect and I was able to collect as well. And what it would appear to us from the data, the, the assertion that airlift increases when Sandals enters a country is actually true um, because Sandals comes with affiliations with various airlines and they will, those airlines will either add flights or enter a market for the first time or increase flights um, based on a sandals entering the market. Um, so that was in fact the case in Grenada and in Barbados. Now, when you look at the question around spend, how much do the tourists spend in each of those markets? While we determined that stopover arrivals did increase in each of, of those markets after sandals entered, the question around spend was much more difficult to determine because when Sandals um, takes a booking from anyone internationally, a lot of that money resides outside of the country. 
So, for example, it's booked and 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 um, I guess from a treasury management function would reside, uh, you know, outside of Barbados. That they bring onshore in U.S. dollars are the funds that they need to convert to local currency to pay their their workers and so on and pay right. their contractors. So it's not that every single dollar that is spent by a tourist who stays at Sandals actually comes on shore. And right. so for that reason, it's a lot more difficult to measure, and it's a lot it's a lot murkier to determine exactly how much the country actually benefits because not all of it comes on on shore. Now, the other thing when we looked at jobs, we were able to say yes, Sandals did create some jobs because you were able to, Sandals was able to say, well, okay, this property was in foreclosure and was closed for her, like a year or whatever. And then when they entered the market, they hired, let's just say 2000 people. And so from that standpoint, you can say, well, Sandal, Sandals did in fact create um, and again, arises as to what quality of jobs, um, you know, these are generally low level um, unskilled workers. And so the quality of the jobs is, is, is what a lot of people question, but having a, a, a low skilled job versus no job is still, yeah. I suppose you can consider that a benefit. So there are benefits, right? Like right. anything else, there are benefits, but there are also drawbacks as now, well. So in terms of um, the diversification of Trinidad and Tobago then, um, are you in agreement with the general consensus that tourism is key for economic diversification? And if so, does that mean you think the government should maybe pursue another um, company or maybe even sandals again but in a more open and transparent way again i go back to the question of where is the empirics where is the evidence that tells us that tourism is the best um industry for for tobago for trinidad for any country to me there has to be some data that tells us why we would say this now tourism is sort of the, the lowest lying fruit it is sort of the obvious thing people want to come on and stay in a warm climate where there's sun, sea, and sand, et cetera, et cetera. But we still haven't examined, for example, what about agriculture? Yeah. What about the fact that we're decriminalizing marijuana all over the world? And perhaps that can be an industry we can look at. What about other types of niche agriculture apart from, from, from marijuana? What about even the fact that if you look at the deal that that uh, sorry Guyana has with Norway around conservation of its forests. Uh, Tobago has, as far as I remember, the lo the oldest uh, nature reserve, reserve in the west yep. in the western hemisphere. Correct. Why don't we try to strike a deal where our reserve, our forest reserve, becomes the asset um, that then Tobago gets paid for not to deforest and you use that money for infrastructure development and so on. So there's so many things that you can think of as that, that, that we can do with Tobago. And I don't think that the default position of tourism right. is always, is, or is necessarily the best thing. The second thing is let us, dis let's, let's assume that the, that the tests and the studies were done that, that suggest that tourism is, is, is a good idea for Tobago. We then have to decide what type of tourism. Mm -hmm. There is ecotourism. There is uh, villa type tourism. There is um, timeshare type tourism. There is, you know, um, niche um, things like health tourism and stuff like that. Medical, yes, yeah. and, and all include the all inclusive model. There are so many different models of tourism. So then you have to then decide what is best. Yeah, luxury Tobago, tourism, mass exactly, tourism. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, and certainly for Tobago, I don't think mass tourism can ever be, and that whole. Uh, you know, mass as well as as all inclusive model. I am not sure that that works would work in a, in a in a country as small as Tobago. So, so we have to decide on all of those things. So I don't think it's a fair thing to just make this blanket statement that tourism is is an option. The other thing is, since when does the government decide what industry works? To me, that should come from the private sector. The private sector is the is the the, the right place for needs and gaps to be identified as to what business opportunities exist. And then the government should be the ones to facilitate by making sure you have proper legislation, proper regulation in place, and that you can 
you can regulate and monitor this this industry. I mean, I, they are I, not I, the ones to decide. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand the, the argument um, you're making, uh, especially you know um, that the THA has been getting um, you know since 2000 a guaranteed share of the national budget. Um, at least 4.03 percent, up to 6.9, and now they're looking to increase it. And um, it, it hasn't demonstrably shown uh, any positive effect, except perhaps making Tobagonians more dependent on government and, and maybe destroying agriculture and these sorts of things. And CPEP and that has but, not unlike Trinidad. Not yeah, unlike Trinidad. Exactly. But yeah. it, it's not that Trinidad is any great economic example either. I mean. Um, Oh, mm -hmm. I mean, although we are relatively more developed, we have our huge problems here in Trinidad, of course. But mm -hmm. um, but the private sector too. I mean, I I'm also skeptical of of the um, strong private sector pushes as well because the private sector equally acts in a um, vacuum of information, and uh, and and I don't I, I don't know that they make better decisions than government. Not that I'm saying government makes the best decision, but. Um, but I, you know, I'm not sure that my faith would would be so uncritically in the hands of the private sector, to put it that way. Do do you agree, if, 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 uh, or do you disagree with that? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the thing about it is, you're right that we created a welfare state in Trinidad and in Tobago, and having created a welfare state, it's difficult. It's a difficult reform and a difficult transition to convert people from being on welfare to now being productive um, and certainly if you want private sector led growth which as a matter of fact in the Caribbean is the only kind of growth that is sustainable to have private sector led growth and to have productivity and competitiveness that drives that is a whole different mindset from what we're used to in Trinidad and Tobago and I guess more so Tobago than Trinidad because as you say the THA has this allocation which basically redistributes and not everybody in Tobago is is employed by the THA, as far as I as far as I understand. So you know there, but I would still say to you, if I was the government or some policymaker that had to decide, I would call up the folks at the chambers of commerce in Tobago and ask them, what is it that that stops or prevents or ha hampers you from doing business in Tobago and investing further in Tobago? What are the industries that you think will work in Tobago because you've identified this throughout the years as being a, a gap? And and that is what I would pay attention to right. um, as opposed to, to the government going in and making a decision. I don't think that that's something that the government is capable of doing. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a public-private partnership in a sense in terms of the planning exercises because cause if there are projects... It should be. It's consultative. It should yeah. be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think so, you know. And if the private sector has projects that they're willing to invest in, but there are log jams and roadblocks uh, that the government can facilitate, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm not aware that um, uh, that any such concentrated exercise is taking place in Tobago. Are, are you aware of anything uh, like that? No, I just, as I mentioned, the Twin Vision 2020 and then 2030, which is. 2020 updated, um, but other than that, no, I'm not aware. I'm right. not aware. Well, I I know that you know you you have your Caribbean economic reports and uh, and, and you make a lot of policy recommendations. We're, we're going to be closing up the interview now, so I, I'd like to for you to just say what do you think is the way forward? I mean, in Trinidad, we're, we're Trinidad and Tobago, we're facing this huge recession, and um, there seems to be no way. <laughs> There seems to be no clear way out. Um, the sandals pullout has um, demoralized the the people who were counting on that. What what, what do you see as as a, a sort of policy prescription the way forward? Well, I I would just want to to say that you know we're not in a recession. Trinidad and Tobago has had zero growth for about ten years. We're in a longer term stagnation, which is worse than a recession. A recession is two or three quarters of of negative growth. Um, what we need in Trinidad and Tobago in the first place is like the 2020 or 2030, we need a development plan that has very clear goals and a clear path that then has to be executed by a specific agency. That agency has to be identified and has to be charged with the responsibility of executing the development plan. We do not have that. We've never had that. Yeah. Um, 
And then the second thing I would say is that any kind of, of, of agenda that we pursue has to be evidence-based, has to be evidence-based. It cannot be by VAPS, which is how we've been used to doing things. But um, it was a pleasure to chat with you, Kirk, and I wish you all the best in this in this program and this discussion. Well, thanks very much. I'm glad to have you on. And um, do you have enjoy the rest of your day, and Thank we'll you. be right back after this message. Okay. Hi, I am Chandali Chanka, your host for the Top 10 Bollywood Countdown. Join me as we count down the top hits of the week and share the latest Bollywood news and tidbits. If you want to be informed, in touch and in tune, then catch me every Sunday right here on IETV. We now reach the SM8 segment, Scratching My Head, where we take a look at some of the absurd, crazy things that go on in our country on a daily basis. Is black magic the only fraud? Seven Indian nationals were deported from Trinidad and Tobago in connection with fraud as it related to what has been called black magic, meaning palm reading, protection from black magic, witchcraft, voodoo, evil spirits, obia, and negative energy. Now, if people are staying in Trinidad illegally, knowingly stealing money from others, and on top of that, sexually harassing them, then of course the law should be brought down on them to the fullest extent possible. But this is being highlighted and reported so prominently that a quasi-tribunal is to be set up in the next two weeks, comprising police, attorneys, and immigration to inquire whether there is any fraud in the alleged practice of black magic, palm reading, and fortune telling. The tribunal is to be established in the next three weeks. My question is, why only single out these practices? Why not the fraud and sexual harassment in the Christian churches as well? The implicit Christian bias is pernicious. It pervades our thoughts and assumptions so that we don't even realize it. It's a way to make Hindu practices seem strange, illegal, fraudulent, and possibly evil, rather than a legitimate part of our faith landscape in Trinidad and Tobago, which it is. Now, if you think I'm exaggerating, just look at the newspaper reporting on this. For example, they write that 45 non-nationals in TT were operating spiritual parlors in San Fernando, Princestown, and Chaguanas. But what's wrong with that? Why is that seen as sinister or potentially criminal? Are they more criminal than foreign Christian preachers? And who are these police attorneys and immigration officers? One would hope that Hindus or people that understand Hinduism are in a majority among these tribunal members. When our national institutions, whether it be the state or the media, still treat the practices of the second largest religion in this country as being strange or black magic, then it has me scratching my head. Well, that's it for this week's show. Please join me again next week when we'll be looking at another current issue affecting our country and look for solutions. In the meanwhile, check out my Facebook page where you can see this and all past episodes and join in lively discussion on this and many other current issues with me and also some of the top thinkers and public figures in the country. Take care and I'll see you next week. Bring out a family fit.